uh, ordinarily we have in the context of these particular examples of potential institutional corruption, we've been thinking about the way in which there might be magnetic deviation caused by a certain influence contrary to the purpose of the institution. Today, there are two separate potential corruptions we're going to be thinking about. <clears throat> One which I'm pretty certain about and the other which I leave for you to judge. So, one relates to the prosecution of Aaron Swartz, and one re relates to the role that I am playing talking about the prosecution of Aaron Swartz. Um, and I leave it to you to decide whether the story about the prosecution is an instance of institutional corruption. That's what we'll be working through. You can decide one way or the other. I don't mean to assert it strongly one way or the other. But it is certainly institutional corruption for me to be talking about the prosecution of Aaron Swartz. Because Aaron Swartz was one of my closest friends. Uh, and as many of you know, I'm sure, uh, at the age of 26, last year in January, January 11th, he committed suicide. Committed suicide after suffering two years of a prosecution brought by the government for his behavior at MIT, which we will be talking about today. So I submit to you it is inappropriate for me to be trying to teach you about the prosecution of Aaron Swartz because there is no way in which I can be appropriately neutral about this. And I'm not, so I admit that. The thing I'm going to try hardest to do is to get through this class without breaking down. That's my goal today. So I want you to help me with that. You know, every once in a while you'll laugh and that'll help me go along and, you know, We'll see if we can get through it. Okay, so Aaron Schwartz had a short life. Half of Aaron's life um, was in public in the sense that he was a prodigy who, through an incredible series of activist uh, activities and activism, changed many fields and many people's lives. At the age of 13, he won the Ars Digita Award um, for innovation related to internet access. There he is, this chubby little 13-year-old. At the age of 14, he was one of the co-founders of RSS. You see that little thing whenever you're on a website about how to get syndicated news services. At the age of 15, he was the chief technical officer of Creative Commons, architecting the technical infrastructure for Creative Commons. Here he is at the launch of Creative Commons. I don't think his voice had changed yet. Okay, so at the age of 17, he entered Stanford University. Um, uh, that was a short lived expedition for him. He dropped out pretty quickly after he entered. Um, at the age of 19, he started a company called Infogami, which then merged and became Reddit. And from the age of 20 until 25, he was working on a whole series of projects that were related to making information accessible and ultimately the organization he started, Demand Progress, which was an activist organization trying to change policy. 26 years, and 12 of those years, um, I considered him a close friend. Uh, when I started giving talks around internet policy, he at the age of you know, 13 or 14, would show up with his mother or dad, and I would be speaking, you know, they would travel all around the country going to these internet conferences, and he was chaperoned, and he would sit in the very front and earnestly listen and raise his hand and ask these very earnest, genius questions. Um, and we began working together, uh, and um, worked together consistently until uh, he died. Um, he was a fellow at the center that I run, the Edmund J. Safra Center, um, um, and so, uh, he was a friend. And here, I want you to just give you a sense of a little bit of the character of this kid. Um, so he started a blog when he went to, to Stanford. 
I had a blog before, but this is the part I want to focus on. So I'm going to give you three little snippets from his blog. Aaron said, I think deeply about things and I want others to do likewise. I work for ideas and learn from people. I don't like excluding people. I'm a perfectionist, but I won't let that get in the way of publication except for education and entertainment. I'm not going to waste my time on things that won't have an impact. I try to be friends with everyone, but I hate it when you don't take me seriously. I don't hold grudges. It's not productive. But I learn from my experience. I want to make the world a better place. Okay, but he was a kid as well as this kid who writes these idealistic little passages. Here's an example of um, his uh, kid-like experience. On the 21st, he, he writes about his orientation at Stanford. Um, and he says that the person giving the Stanford orientation, after we, afterwards we go over the do's and don'ts of campus life, like, you know, smoke your pot over by the lake, keep your vomit from binge drinking off the floor, and never, ever, ever share files over the internet, right? That was kind of Stanford in the early 19, in 2000s. Like priorities a little bit screwed up, but okay. Um, here's day 58. Cat and Vicky want to know why I eat breakfast alone, reading a book instead of talking to them. I explain to them that however nice and interesting they are, the book is written by an intelligent expert <laughs> filled with novel facts. <laughs> They explain to me that not sitting with someone you know is a major social faux pas and not, having, and not having a need to talk to people is just downright abnormal. I patiently suggest that perhaps it is they who are abnormal. After all, I can talk to people if I like, but they are unable to be alone. <laughs> they patiently suggest that I'm being offensive and best watch myself if I don't want to alienate the few people who still talk to me. And then um, January 2006, I've decided to stop being embarrassed. I'm saying goodbye to the whole thing. That growing suspicion at the mo as the moment approaches, that sense of realization when it comes, that bl rush of blood reddening your cheek, that brief but powerful desire to jump out of your own skin, and then finally attempt a big fake smile trying to cover it all. Sure, it was fun for a while, but I think it's outlived its usefulness. It's time for embarrassment to go. Okay, so these... Clips, I think you get a sense, you know kids this age, so you get a sense of who this kid was. That's Aaron and his life, uh, um, uh, which uh, is a significant chunk of which devoted to trying to do what he thought would make the world a better place. All right, so these organizations um, all span a wide range of ideas, but we can uh, put them into certain periods. I say three periods. There's a BC, as in before copyright. There's a copyright period. And then there's an AC, as in after copyright. OK, but let's start with the copyright point. It's really important to recognize this kid was not really pro or anti-copyright. Barack Obama gave his famous speech before he started running for president about the Iraq war, where he said, I don't oppose all wars. What I'm opposed to is a dumb war. Aaron could have said the same thing. He doesn't oppose all copyright. He opposed dumb copyright. And by dumb, he meant copyright that doesn't serve copyright's purpose. So for example, there's an online database called PACER, which is created by the government, giving you access to public domain court documents. PACER charges eight cents a page to get access to that information. The first thing you might think is, what does it mean, a page in the digital age? Right? What is a page? But anyway, that's the way they think about it. But it's eight cents a page to uncopyrighted government data, the stuff that we're entitled to for freely because that's the purpose of making it accessible. So Aaron got together um, uh, with a friend, uh, Carl Malamud, to liberate PACER. Um, by basically going into a library that gave them free access to PACER. PACER ran these library days where you could go to the library and get access to free. He opened up his computer. He wrote a little script that sucked down all of PACER onto his laptop, and he walked out of the library with it. Um, did it violate any copyright to do that? No, it's not copyrighted. Did it violate the terms of service? No, there were no terms of service that said you couldn't do what he did. Did it violate any technical protections? No, there were no technical protections. 
just basically made it accessible. He used his script to take it down. It was a script to access more quickly something that everybody had the right to access. You could think of it as a loophole that was enabled by his technical facility with computers. So, you know, we have a culture celebrating and encouraging loopholes. You know, here's an article from Huffington Post talking about how lobbyists will fight for loopholes in tax policy. When they do that, they do that for private gain. But Aaron's purpose in sucking down the PACER database and then he and Carla Malaman making it available freely on the web was for public gain. So he was exercising his technical skill to take advantage of a loophole for the public's good. Um, that was consistent with his basic view about copyright that he was against restrictions that were not serving a public interest. Or a second famous example, the United States Copyright Office has a database of all registered copyrights. This is a technical term, but that database sucks. Um, <laughs> Carl and Aaron decided to liberate that database as well. So they went to the Library of Congress and they wrote a script that snarfed down the whole database of the copyright um, um, system. Did that violate any copyright? No. Did it violate any terms of service? No. Did it violate any technical protections? No. Once again, he was taking advantage of a loophole, an unexpected use to get access to this public data. Now in both cases, what's critical to see here is that the kind of data he was accessing was not like the Sony Music or Sony Film Archive or the Universal Music Archive. He wasn't downloading content that was privately owned for a private purpose to advance the profit of the creators. He was intervening in context where the restrictions made no sense, made no copyright sense, and he tried to evade them. So that's What's critical to see here and also critical is to see the reactions. When he and Carl engaged in the PACER database project, the FBI launched an investigation of his criminal activity, followed him, put cars outside his parents' house, monitored him to see just what kind of criminal he was trying to make accessible public access to public data. Um, but refreshingly, the Copyright Office's response was very different. The Registrar of Copyright wrote a letter um, uh, to Carl Malamud saying, no problem in you stealing our whole database. There's no copyright protection in these records. They are in the public domain. The database is of the online records is likewise in the public domain. They understood there was no legitimate reason to be restricting access, and so when they made themselves uh, capable of taking all of this content and making it better accessible to other people, the Copyright Office said, totally fine, because Copyright Office, the one thing they get is copyright law. Okay, so because it was not serving any public purpose, um, it was unproblematic hacking in this sense. Okay, now we've got to be clear about this term, hacking. In the popular consciousness, the word hacking has a negative connotation. People think of hackers, they think of people stealing IDs or breaking into banks and um, stealing credit card numbers. But the concept of hacking is uh, much more ambiguous. Um, there is uh, good hacking and bad hacking. And good hacking is the sort of thing that lawyers typically do, right? Lawyers figure out a way to use the law to take advantage of whatever freedoms the law gives to make their clients better off. Um, but technical hacking, you could think, is better than what lawyers do because the hacking that I'm talking about is hacking which is in the public interest as opposed to the client's interest if a lawyer. But in both cases, they're using technical knowledge to advance um, a public or private good. Um, okay, so that's the context of what he would do. We would say Aaron was a hacker. But he was not just a hacker. He was also an internet activist. But he was not just an internet activist either because in the last important stage of his life he became an activist for social problems that were not directly related to the internet. Everything up to this last stage had been in some sense related to the internet, how to make access to information more free how to make it easier for people to share and create information, how to make it easier for people to aggregate community activity on the web. That's what led to Reddit. Um, but at the last stage, he decided to focus exclusively on these things that he thought were in the public good, 
not just because they were related to the internet. I'm not quite sure when it happened for him, um, but I'm fairly sure when the same shift happened for me because as you've heard, as I've described, much of my career had been working like he had been in the context of internet policy, but uh, uh, I shifted. And I shifted in 2006. Um, Aaron had come to a conference, this conference, 23, uh, the 23rd Chaos Computer Conference in Berlin. I was in Berlin for the year writing a book about copyright policy. Um, Aaron came to visit me. I was proud to show him my book and the presentation that I was putting together for it. He was not so impressed. He said to me, so how are you ever going to make progress on these issues? Issues of copyright policy, internet policy. So long as there's this basic corruption in the way our government works. I pushed back against Aaron a little bit. I a little bit miffed he wasn't excited about my book. Um, so I said to him, you know, it's not my field, Aaron. What I do is copyright policy, internet policy. He said, yeah. Uh, as an academic, you mean it's not your field? I said, yeah, as an academic, it's not my field. That's why I don't do corruption work. But he said, okay, but what about as a citizen? As a citizen, is it your field then? And this was his style. He never lectured, he never told you what you should do, he asked. He just asked you questions and in the reflection on the meaning of the questions, his meaning, his statement, his purpose was as clear as my four-year-old's hug. The meaning of my four-year-old's hug is transparent and his questions were as well. And his questions were directed to get me to recognize how Somehow, we had to figure out how to focus on this more fundamental problem, and it was at that moment I decided I would, which shifted my work and eventually led me here and eventually led me to teaching you, which of course, what could be better than that, right? Um, so this is the sense in which after he died, people would write these stories, like Ross Story wrote this story about me being his mentor. I actually kind of felt like I was his mentee, right? He was the mentor. He was the one guiding in this sense what I should do. Okay, so as the mentee, um, I want to think about the way in which the prosecutor intervened in the course of this kid's life. So at first, when we shifted the work that we were doing, Aaron and I started this organization called Change Congress, which then eventually became Root Strikers. But Aaron eventually got impatient and discouraged by the reform work. Barack Obama was elected president. He thought this was the great progressive moment. We were gonna have a progressive president. We have a thousand things we could get done. So that's why he started this group called Demand Progress. And they started eagerly, actively pushing the administration to do all the things they thought the administration to do. And our work at that point kind of diverged. He was engaged in the activity of using power to push Barack to the left, or maybe to turn Barack into Elizabeth. Um, uh, while I was in the, pro in the business of reminding Barack Obama of this point of his campaign. Wait, look, it's exactly six years ago. Barack says, if we're not willing to take up that fight, and the fight he's talking about in this passage is to change the way Washington works, then real change, change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans will keep getting blocked by the defenders of the status quo. That's the fight I thought we should have. Aaron thought we should have the fight to make sure that Barack would become Elizabeth Warren. So there was a lot of teasing in the last stages of, our, of his life, right? I teased him that he had given up the real fight to engage in list building and getting girls. Um, but I was convinced he would return to this fight someday, that someday we would be together in this and you know, hopefully, well, before the McCutcheon decision win um, eventually, okay. Now, the thing is to change your career, to change your focus, to, to, to say I'm no longer working on one thing, I'm gonna work on something else, turns out to be pretty hard. When I did it, people challenged me as a betraying the internet or betraying the movements that I'd helped to start in the context of the internet. He, felt he was condemned to be an internet activist 
forever. People would never quite believe that he was giving it up and he was going to just focus on justice issues. And that became quite pressing in September of 2010. Um, his in, in his last public speech describing the events that led up to the um, battle over Sopa Pippa. So for me, it all started with a phone call. It was September, not last year, but the year before that, September 2010. And I got a phone call from my friend Peter. Aaron, he said, there's an amazing bill that you have to take a look at. Well, what is it, I said. It's called COICA, the Combating Online Infringement and Counterfeiting Act. Oh, Peter, I said, I don't care about copyright law. Maybe you're right, maybe Hollywood is right, but either way, what's the big deal? I'm not going to waste my life fighting over a little issue like copyright, health care, financial reform. Those are the issues that I work on. Not something obscure like copyright law. So even though he had spent the last seven years of his life working on it, now he was telling the world he was not going to work on it because it's too obscure. But what he was feeling inside was this. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. <laughs> and he was eventually pulled back in. Um, he, shortly after he got that call from Peter, writes me. He says, I'm planning a campaign against this crazy new Koika bill tomorrow. Don't know if you've followed it, but requires eyes, please, blah, blah, blah. I ignore that because when I get this, I have a lesser reaction. Every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in. So I'm playing Costanza here, right? Um, and I just say, no, I'm not going to do this internet stuff. I want to do corruption stuff. So after about a month, he writes, tries to get me to follow up. Any idea Lofgren? Lofgren's a great congresswoman from California. Would be willing to take a stand against COICA. I respond, what, is that a virus? Um, <laughs> he says, internet censorship bill, close enough. Um, um, but this was, a, this was an incredible proposal to basically give the government the ability to bring an action. Imran action means an action against a piece of property. Nobody even has to show up. They just bring an action, file a lawsuit, and get a domain name removed from the internet if they think the domain name has been engaging in piracy. So Demand Progress launched this fact sheet against this and uh, um, against this, and uh, the bill passed the Senate Judiciary Committee, but because of the ruckus they were raising, it never received a full vote on the Senate floor, and they thought this was an amazing victory. But then shortly after that victory, like Jason in Friday the 13th, it came back, uh, and it came back as the Pippa and Sopa bill. And so they started this fight against Sopa and Pippa, and they were one of the core organizers behind the battle of Sopa and Pippa. Um, started getting key senators like Wyden to launch opposition to it. And after a while, um, they were beginning to win. And if you might remember, um, incredibly, sites like Craigslist and uh, uh, Reddit and eventually Wikipedia on um, one day went dark for 24 hours in opposition to Sopa Pippa, and this was a kind of totally unexpected, complete victory. Is Aaron describing this? And that victory. was when, as hard as it was for me to believe, after all this, we had won. The thing that everyone said was impossible, that some of the biggest companies in the world had written off as kind of a pipe dream, had happened. We did it. We won. And then we started rubbing it in. <laughs> you all know what happened next. Wikipedia went black. Reddit went black. Craigslist went black. The phone lines on Capitol Hill flat out melted. Members of Congress started rushing to issue statements, retracting their support for the bill that they were promoting just a couple days ago. And it was just ridiculous. I mean, th there's a chart from the time that captures it pretty well. It says something like, January 14th on one side, and it has this big, long list of names supporting the bill, and then just a few lonely people opposing it. And then on the other side, it says January 15th, and now it's totally reversed. Everyone is opposing it, just a few lonely names still hanging on in support. I mean, this really was unprecedented. Don't take my word for it, but ask former Senator Chris Dodd, now the chief lobbyist for Hollywood. He admitted after he lost, that he had masterminded the whole evil plan. And he told the New York Times he'd never seen anything like it during his many years in Congress. And everyone I've spoken to agrees. The people rose up and they caused a sea change in Washington. Not the press, which refused to cover the story, 
just coincidentally, their parent companies all happen to be lobbying for the bill. Not the politicians, who are pretty much unanimously in favor of it. And not the companies who had all but given up trying to stop it and decided it was inevitable. It was really stopped by the people. So victory. Um, but importantly, this is the point that he rubbed into me. It was not just a victory in the copyright fights. It was also a victory in getting people to recognize the issue that he and I originally had worked on, this issue of corruption. As Wyden said, the win is a triumph over other very special, uh, very powerful special interests. And that triumph produced a certain kind of recognition that there was a more fundamental issue at stake here. That was the issue that he had tried to get me to focus on, this issue of corruption. Um, and that there was a more interesting political reality enabled by the way in which the net had begun to grow up. Here's one last okay. clip here. Now, I've told this as a personal story, partly because I think big stories like this one are just more interesting at human scale. The director, J.D. Walsh, says, good stories should be like the poster for Transformers. There's a huge evil robot on the left side of the poster and a huge big army on the right side of the poster. And then in the middle, at the bottom, there's just a small family trapped in the middle. Big stories need human stakes. But mostly it's a personal story because I didn't have time to research any of the other part of it. <laughs> but that's kind of the point. We won this fight because everyone made themselves the hero of their own story. Everyone took it as their job to save this crucial freedom. They threw themselves into it. They did whatever they could think of to do. They didn't stop to ask anyone for permission. You remember how Hacker News readers spontaneously organized this boycott of GoDaddy over their support of SOPA? Nobody told them they could do that. A few people even thought it was a bad idea. It didn't matter. The senators were right. The internet really is out of control. Out of control. OK, that was his victory. It's one of the only moments that I kind of saw him this is a good picture of it, feeling this pride at a victory, because usually he was quite critical of his own lack of victories here. Um, OK, before that victory, exactly a year before that victory, Aaron was arrested at this place, Building 16 of MIT, um, after noticing some unusual activity, they had installed a webcam in a server room and they had discovered um, Aaron, as they described it in their charges. He was, quote, breaking into a restricted computer wiring closet at MIT. He broke in by opening the door handle that was unlocked. That was the sense of breaking in. Accessing MIT's network without authorization. MIT's network, as we'll describe in a minute, was an open access network. Anybody literally has permission to access their network according to their own policies. Connect to JSTOR's archive of digital ties journal articles. That's true. Avoid, uh, use this access to download a major portion of JSTOR's article uh, archive. That's also true. To avoid J MIT and JSTOR's effort to prevent this massive copying. Yep. And elude detection and identification. Look, here he is, eluding <laughs> detection and identification. Um, so he was trying to access this thing called JSTOR. How many of you have used JSTOR? Okay, everybody knows JSTOR, right. JSTOR starts basically when you're born, 1995. Um, it's a Mellon Foundation project, and it's a hugely important archive. This many journals, 38 million pages. When it was launched, everybody thought this was an amazing and brilliant idea to give access uh, in an extraordinary way to this past archive of, digit, uh, of uh, academic knowledge. But increasingly, JSTOR was being criticized. Carl Malamud, the guy who was involved in those two liberation projects I described, um, began to attack it as morally offensive, $20 for a six-page article unless you happen to work at a fancy school. Um, so what he's pointing to is, is a pretty important dynamic, and you can see the dynamic in this story. So um, here's a Harvard professor interviewed about her new job at Harvard. Um, the interviewer sort of ran out of questions, so turned to this. Um, noticed there were no books on her shelf, and so uh, said, why are there no books? And Gita Gopinath said, everything I need is on the internet now. Okay, so what does that mean? So consider you wanted to do work on corruption. Good thing for you to do. Say you went to Google Scholar, not from a Harvard machine, and you searched on campaign finance. These would be the top articles you get. 
if you're not in a Harvard machine, you try to access these articles, this is what you would find. The number one article you could get if you paid $29.95. Number two article is protected by JSTOR. Don't know exactly what the permissions are to get access to it. Number three um, article is also uh, $29.95. Um, number four, you can get if you sign up for a free trial um, and then uh, pay $99 after a year. Um, number five, use also buy JSTOR. Um, not clear how you get access to it. Number six, tells you you can purchase it for $10 from JSTOR. Number seven, protected by JSTOR. Not clear how you get access to it. Number eight, protected by JSTOR. Nine, protected by JSTOR. Ten, $29.95. So how accessible is this information? Well, one of them is free, one time only. One of them is $10. One of them is, uh, three of them are $29.95. Five of them are terms unknown. So when Professor Gopinath says everything is free on the internet, uh, what does that mean? It means if, and this turns out to be a very big if, you're a tenured professor at an elite university, or maybe just a professor at an elite university, or maybe students are professor at an elite university, or maybe students are professor at American universities, if you're one of those people, we could call them the knowledge elite, then you have free access. But the rest of the world, not so much. Now, people sort of think there's a name that should be associated with this. I think this name should be outrageous. Hillary Clinton, she's showing what I mean here. <laughs> it's outrageous because we, the academics, built this world. We built this world because it flows from the deployment of our copyright. We write things, we have a copyright, we deploy it in a particular way by assigning it to journals who then build this exclusive access. But here, the copyright is designed to benefit the publishers. It's not enabling the authors. There's not one of these authors who gets any money from the restriction to their article. They don't get paid by the number of downloads. Not one of them who wants distribution limited. Not one of them has a business model that's based on restriction. We are academics. We want our work read broadly, freely, as many people as possible. Not one of them should support this system as a knowledge policy for these creators. It's crazy. It's an example of dumb copyright policy. And that's the sort of policy that Aaron opposed. Now, what I didn't realize was just how much he opposed it, how much it really troubled him. New Republic, after he died, wrote this story about um, him attending this conference um, in uh, Africa about this and commenting to somebody, rich people pay huge amounts of money to access articles, but what about the researcher in Accra, Dar es Salaam, Cambodia, genuinely opened his eyes to this problem. He hadn't really focused on it until he'd gone to this conference. And in response, he started this thing. He called it the Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto. A manifesto. And the manifesto announced in very bold terms a project to make access to this information broadly available. So he says, information is power, but like all power, there are those who want to keep it for themselves. The world's entire scientific and cultural heritage, published over centuries in books and journals, is increasingly being digitized and locked up by a handful of private corporations. Open access will only apply to those things published in the future. Everything up till now will have been lost. That's too high a price to pay, forcing academics to pay money to read the work of their colleagues, scanning an entire libraries, but only allowing the folks at Google to read them, providing scientific articles to those elite universities in the first world, but not to the children of the global south. It's outrageous and unacceptable. And the manifesto said, we can fight back. We need to take information wherever it is stored, make our copies, share them with the world. We need to download scientific journals and upload to the file sharing networks. We need to fight for o guerrilla open access. And if you clicked on this little page, it told you you could give him the stuff that you had downloaded and he would make them available broadly. Okay, that was a project in 2008 that he began. Then in 2010, he went to this very um, uh, big conference in Budapest about access to the global world. And there was a conversation about, well, what if we just buy access to the developing world for JSTOR? And a number was mentioned as about how much it would cost. Turns out this number is not true, but this is what was told to them. They said it would cost $250 million to get free access for the developing world to the JSTOR database. Um, and that was too much money for him, for anybody. It's a lot of money. So that shifted him in a different direction. This was a lecture he was giving at University of Illinois. That scientific legacy going back to the Enlightenment, 
that's still behind locked gates. But you, you have a key to those gates. And with a little bit of shell script magic, you can get those journal articles. You can download copies of them. And once you have a copy, theoretically, you could make it available to everyone. And if you don't know how to make it available to everyone without getting caught, you can go to gorillaopenaccess.com and find my mailing address. And hard drives that get sent there will find their way online. OK, so he never spoke to me about this project. Um, and I think he never spoke to me about this project because he knew that I didn't support it. In my view, this issue is much more complicated. Not the copyright issue, but what we should do about the copyright issue. I think it's, or, it's OK to organize to try to do something about it. But I wasn't so convinced about civil disobedience here. I wasn't so convinced because I think the JSTOR story is a little bit more ambiguous. JSTOR, it turns out, doesn't set its prices. It's the journal itself that sets the prices. Um, JSTOR actually does real access good. There are have and have nots in the world, but after JSTOR, the have nots might be the same, but there are many more people who are considered haves. And number three, um, it takes, uh, uh, civil disobedience here is an incredibly risky undertaking. Right? Civil disobedience in the tradition that we think of, like the civil disobedience in the civil rights movement, civil disobedience that led, um, uh, Dr. King to get arrested 69 times is a kind of civil disobedience that's done in public by people willing to pay the penalty because they're able to pay the penalty. They're capable of paying the penalty. The penalty is reasonable. But copyright policy is different. Um, the civil disobedience that's engaged about copyright policy is typically not done in public. It's done by people who are actually not willing to pay the penalty and they're not willing to pay the penalty because they're not able to pay the penalty. Right? So compare, this man gets arrested for scores of misdemeanors. He gets charged with just two felonies in the whole of his career. He's acquitted of both of those charges. Uh, Aaron, by contrast, gets arrested once, charged with 13 felonies, threatened with 35 years in jail. So he knew this. <coughs> about my view that I didn't support this. So the alleged crime that he engaged in was not something he did at Harvard. He was a fellow here at Harvard when he did it. He just went over to MIT to do it, um, to engage in this activity which the government calls a crime. So how do we understand what he did? So my view, it's not obviously legal what he did, but is, is it obviously illegal? So that depends on what he was doing, what his purpose was. There are a couple possibilities. Number one, he could have been hoarding these academic articles. You know, I'm sure all of you kind of wish you had all academic knowledge on a thumb drive, right? So, you know, he just like to carry it around, show it off at a party. Here it is, all academic knowledge. Um, <laughs> so maybe he was doing that. Um, or number two, maybe he was going to engage in a research project. Turns out when he was at Stanford, he worked with a Stanford law student. They downloaded all academic articles out of Westlaw for lecture. Westlaw or Lexis. They then analyzed the funding sources for all those articles and the authors to try to show some relationship between funding source and authors and the ultimate conclusion. They're trying to demonstrate the corruption inside of legal academics. So in principle, um, uh, he could have been doing the exact same thing, it's Westlaw, um, for all academic articles. That could have been his reasons for downloading it. Or number three, he could be liberating these articles for the third world. That was certainly the upshot of the suggestion from Noam Schreiber's article. Number four, he could be liberating it for the whole world, not just the developing world. That's what it, the guerrilla open access movement sounded like it was trying to do. Or number five, he could be trying to make a lot of money by you know, selling access to these academic articles because there's such a huge demand for them in the world. People want to buy them just like they want to buy movies from Sony. You know, after all, it was $250 million to get access to it. Okay, but that's a joke. Nobody thinks that there was any market for academic articles out there. Nobody thinks people were willing to pay for it. So nobody thinks he was really doing this for the money. So that means he could have been doing it for one of these four reasons. So if those are the things he could have been doing, how could that be wrong? What kind of wrong is it? 
Well, it was a wrong at its core because it was a violation of something called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was inspired by a movie. How many of you saw this movie? David Lightman was a master at computer games. A fast thinker. Oh, David! <laughs> Maybe you can tell us who first suggested the idea of reproduction without sex. Your wife? <laughs> Get out, my dear. And a promising student Hi. at an old game. Hi. With an electronic twist. Those are your grades? Yeah. I don't think that I deserved it. Do you? You can go to jail for that. Only if you're over 18. This computer company is coming out with these amazing new games in a couple of months. And I want to play those games. Wow. What? You got something. He found the right code word to play the game. We're in. But it was the wrong computer. Shall we play a game? How can I ask you that? How about global thermal nuclear war? Fine. All right. Okay, so you get the picture. America was terrified that some kid was going to do that with, uh, with the uh, nuclear uh, arsenal. So they passed the statute, the CFAA, which makes it a felony to get access without authorization or to exceed your authorized access. So you're allowed in, but you do more than you're supposed to do, or you crack or hack into the system. So when Aaron was charged, he was charged with a series of indictments, but the second indictment basically drops any claim about exceeding authorized access. The only thing he was charged with uh, at the CFAA level was unauthorized access to the MIT network. So was he guilty of that? Um, well, it depends on what he did. So here's what he did, um, or what he actually did. Um, he didn't engage in what we traditionally think of as hacking didn't sort of use code to break into a computer system. Because if you look at a JSTOR URL, here's one from the Harvard uh, libraries, the URL just is a simple number that ends with a serial number which ties to a particular publication. And they're not fancy, they're just numbers, right? So the script that he built to snarf all this down basically just started sequence Zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way up. So he could just download them all down. Pretty simple stuff. Um, um, he wanted to do it as quickly as possible. So he started, he ran the script, made a very efficient way to sort of initiate the download of all those articles. When JSTOR noticed it, JSTOR blocked the IP address that was trying to do it. So Aaron then took a new IP address. When JSTOR noticed that, it blocked a whole range of IP addresses. That began to cause trouble because it shut all of MIT down. They weren't able to get access to JSTOR. So JSTOR blocked the MAC address, which is not the address of the Macintosh computer, but it's the address of your internet um, access point. So Aaron spoofed his MAC address, just created a new one. Um, all of these activities to keep this program, keep grabbing this Python script running, um, so it was basically a cat and mouse game. Aaron was the cat, JSTOR was the mouse, or maybe in this version here. So um, there was a lot of technical trips to enable the download of lots of articles. He was clearly permitted to have access to some of those articles. The contract with JSTOR said he wasn't allowed to take all of those articles. And code was, was deployed to block him when he started taking lots of those articles. Aaron was alleged to have tried to ev evade that code. But the question is whether that was unauthorized. And here's why that was an important question. MIT has what's called the open access policy. And when MIT finally wrote a report about Aaron's death and the activities of MIT, um, this is what the report said. He would have been logged into the MIT system as a guest. Would he have then been given access? If the answer to that question is yes, then it seems possible that Aaron Swartz's access to the MIT network was authorized notwithstanding his inappropriate means of implementing access or then of abusing such access, which may themselves have been violations of different criminal or civil prohibitions, but wouldn't have triggered the CFAA. And then quite amazingly, at the, as this report continues, as far as the review panel could determine, MIT was never asked by either the prosecution or the defense whether Aaron Swartz's access to the MIT network was, aus or was authorized or unauthorized nor did MIT ask this of itself. Given that MIT was the alleged victim, 
to the MIT access policies, its rules, and its own interpretation of those rules were at the heart of the government's case. And three, this policy and the rules were written and interpreted and applied by MIT for MIT's own missions and goals, not those of the government. The review panel wonders why. Wonders why MIT didn't tell the government that in fact what Aaron was doing was authorized, not unauthorized access. Now that's pretty critical because if it was authorized, there's no criminal prosecution. And so in the two years of the government's criminal prosecution, you would have thought somebody at some point would have said, hey, wait a minute, there's no crime here. Turns out there was somebody who did. The head of the media lab actually emailed the president of MIT and said to the president, look, we have this open access policy. Why is he being prosecuted under a uh, statute that says unauthorized? MIT did nothing. The president did nothing in response to that email. Just ignored it. Just let the prosecution go forward. So the one entity that had the ability to say, hey, stop, this didn't make any sense, just stood silent and let it continue. Ethan Zuckerman, who's a researcher at MIT and a big internet um, civil society researcher, um, has taken a lead in MIT attacking the university for what the university did. Zuckerman said, this is a university that's internationally known for student pranks, like putting a police car on the dome. One of the first questions, I think, is does this only apply when you're having fun? Or does this apply when you're engaged in politics or social change? And then Harry Lewis from Harvard wrote this about this uh, incident. He said, I, th I think the worry is that the institute, which was always freewheeling, fun-loving, and impish behavior tolerating, tolerating, is becoming captive to a set of lawyerly and administrative dictates. Because here's where your institutional corruption um, sense, uh, sensor should be going off. Says the, says the computer science professor and former Harvard Dean Harry Lewis, who taught both Zuckerberg, not Zuckerman, and Bill Gates. Universities are much more beholden to officials in the federal government, state, and local governments to stay on their good side, but there's something lost when the lawyers and the people who have to make the business of the university run get to influence decisions that have real educational and philosophical and student life related consequences. Okay, now. We don't know ultimately whether he was guilty. His lawyer um, was incredibly optimistic that the charges would be proven to be baseless, that the access was authorized, and that there was no harm done. But that turns out what we mean by harm. And this turns out that harm in cyberspace is pretty ambiguous, which is an ambiguous harm. So compare, for exam uh, example, there's no ambiguity that in all the protests that Martin Luther King organized, the sit-ins, the marches, the blocking of traffic and so on, there was harm done. No ambiguity. There certainly was harm done. It was justified. I'm glad he did it, but there was harm done. But there is an ambiguity about the deploying of something like a Python script called KeyGrabIt. You know, if the Python script is downloading articles, it may be harmful. But if it's downloading credit card data, it's certainly harmful. So it's possible that it's harmful. It's possible it's not harmful. So the harm is ambiguous, meaning the statute is ambiguous. Statute which says if it's unauthorized access, then it causes harm. Statute then gets tied to the intent. What was your purpose in doing what you did? Was your purpose to make money for yourself, to harm other people? This government charged Schwartz intended to distribute a significant portion of JSTOR's archived digitized journal articles through one or more file sharing sites. But even that raises a question about harm, right? So if that's what he was doing, he wasn't trying to hoard, he wasn't trying to research. But it's not clear that even that would have been harmful if he was trying to do it just in the third world. It would have been harmful if he was doing it for the whole world. So let's see why that's true. Even here, we see this ambiguous harm. Um, uh, the US attorney, Carmen Ortiz, when they filed the um, indictment against Aaron, gave a big press conference where they bragged about how they were threatening him with 35 years in jail, said, stealing is stealing whether you use a computer command or a crowbar. Um, which kind of suggested to me she knows little about crowbars or computer commands. Um, 
Because with respect to, tr with respect to harm, that's just simply not true. Right? So think again about Aaron's purpose if his harm was to release work to the third world. In the third world, there was no access to JSTOR. There was no access to JSTOR. So Aaron's access to JSTOR in a context where there was no competing access from JSTOR wasn't going to cause JSTOR any harm because they weren't going to lose any sales, right? Because there were no sales. And in the first world, there's not a single institution that now pays JSTOR to access JSTOR's database who's going to say, we don't need to pay just because JSTOR is available on BitTorrent. Harvard's not going to say, you know, go to BitTorrent to get access to JSTOR. <laughs> it's too expensive for us, right? So there is zero market harm from the alleged desire to make the stuff available, which is why JSTOR very immediately said they want to settle any fight they had with Aaron. They didn't want the prosecution to go forward. They, they were happy that um, they just get the data back and make it go away. Um, and that brings out the ambiguity. This guy with respect to a computer is, this guy, is different from this guy with respect to a crowbar. With a computer, sometimes it's harmful. Sometimes the, quote, stealing, end quote, is harmful. With the crowbar, it's always harmful. <laughs> it's always harmful. Um, so it's ambiguous until you get to the CFAA. Um, because the fact that it can be harmful, but it, ne but it need not be harmful, shows we need prosecutors who tell the difference, who can tell the difference between Aaron and evil. Who can look at this and say, what kind of harm was this? What were they doing? One of the most important cases interpreting the CFAA, Judge Kaczynski in the Ninth Circuit writes, the government assures us that whatever the scope of the CFAA, it won't prosecute minor violations. It assures us of that. But in this case, the more the government knew about what was going on, what the purpose was, what Aaron's past was, the more vicious they were in their prosecution, despite this assurance. Instead, um, we saw a different kind of behavior manifested. It was the kind of, I'm right, therefore I'm right to nuke you attitude. It was the kind of bullying the government was engaging in to scare others away, this kind of example justice. So others would look at this and say, OK, we understand. If you step over this line, you're going to be in very serious trouble. Um, the Department of Justice, according to an article that you read for this class, um, US attorney said it was foolish to campaign against the prosecution, by which he means Aaron was foolish, referring to the campaigns run by Demand Progress. Um, he said that Aaron's decision to have demand progress write about and gather support on the day of his arrest took the case from a human one-on-one -on -one level to an institutional level. Now just think of what that's saying. Here's a government prosecutor who's saying, the fact you complained about the prosecution against you means the government is going to prosecute you more vigorously. Kind of weird, right? Because you'd think the whole idea of a First Amendment, the right to criticize the government especially, should mean that the fact that you criticize the government shouldn't expose you to more prosecution from the government. But that's the position they took. And they manifested this strict attitude all the way through this experience. As his father said, they strip searched him when they arrested him. They took away his shoelaces. This is not when they arrested him. When he showed up, he voluntarily turned himself over. They put him in solitary confinement and left him there. They brought him out in handcuffs. Then after his bomb was posted, they left him in a cell for hours with no explanation. It was sadistic. It was a purpose to teach him a lesson. And as a teacher, um, I think we have to admit they lost in that purpose because whatever lesson was taught was not certainly taught or learned by him. So the point is, you don't need to believe that Aaron was right in what he did to have a perspective to see why maybe the government was wrong in what it did. Because even if it was right to say that it was a crime here, I'm not convinced it was right, but let's say you do believe it was right, still there is this obligation of government prosecution to be disproportional, or to be proportional, 
seems increasingly an obligation to be disproportional, but to be proportional. And the wrong you would charge here about what the government did was the wrong of being disproportional. You know, especially in a world where the engineers of the financial catastrophe regularly dine at the White House, or as Elizabeth Warren in her first weeks as the uh, senator from the state uh, was puzzled to see why no bank was actually ever prosecuted for um, the failures on Wall Street. In that context, it seems weird for the government to insist that this kid has to be labeled a felon. And it brings back these words of Thoreau. So Thoreau writes, unjust laws exist. Shall we be content to obey them? Or shall we endeavor to amend them and obey them until we have succeeded? Or shall we transgress them at once? Men generally under such a government as this think that they ought to wait until they have persuaded the majority to alter them. They think that if they should resist, the remedy would be worse than the evil. That is Thoreau right. It is the fault of the government itself that the remedy is worse than the evil because it makes it worse. So why does it not, why does the government not cherish its wise minority? Why does it cry and resist before it is hurt? Why does it not encourage its citizens to be on the alert to point out its faults and to do better than it would have them? Okay, so we have some actors. We have Aaron, we have MIT, and we have the US government. We can say there are good things that each of them did, and there are things that we want to be maybe critical about we each of them did. So what I'm going to do now is I want you to tell me, help me fill out this chart for each of them. What do you think the good and the bad is that they did? You can do that out loud by just saying it instead of in your head, which I know you're all working through it in your head. It's not a quiz for yourself. It's for a conversation for all of us. So, yeah. So that's a good. Okay. They could, have defend, they could have defended it, or they could have recognized there was a need for them to step forward. You know, as I think about this, I think that there's this, this is a classic conflict between the geek mentality and the lawyer's mentality. Okay, so the geek mentality is very optimistic. Kind of thinks it'll all work itself out in the end. You know, so they kind of think there's a system over there, it's a system of laws that will figure out Aaron's not guilty. If he's not guilty, it's not for us to worry about. The lawyer mentality looks at a situation like this and says, holy shit, <laughs> if you have a way to get this kid out of the criminal prosecution system, you need to do it because the criminal prosecution system is awful, awful, awful. It really screws up an incredibly large percentage of the time, much more than our sort of fancy ideals about the legal system suggest to us. So, the fact that you know there's a simple statement you can make, his access was authorized, or a jury is likely to find his access was authorized, which would lead to the government radically rethinking his case, is a pretty important thing to say. And the idea that you would sit silently is like walking by a pool where a six-month-old is drowning and just saying, well, his mother will come along, I'm sure. So I'm moving on. So that's part of this that I think many people at MIT were kind of shocked when they realized that these facts matter. Okay, more. I'll switch it. Yeah. Is there an indication that general counsel addressed this issue at MIT? Addressed it in what sense? I mean, the general counsel so got this information and decided not to do something with sure. it. Sure. I wouldn't tend to think that a, an institution's attorney in that sort of way um, finds himself in a bail case that's wired to consider exculpatory evidence of someone not. Then why 
it's actually pretty consistent with how, they've, how they explained it. Although it's a little hard to fit it with the facts. So because MIT took the position that if Aaron had been a student at MIT, they would have much more aggressively tried to defend him. But he wasn't a student at MIT. But he was a regular collabor uh, collaborator at MIT. His father was an employee of MIT. He worked in the MIT Media Lab with uh, projects at MIT. He was as famous at MIT as anybody could be because he was this boy wonder. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the World Wide Web, had first brought him into the World Wide Web at the age of 13 as setting up protocols for the World Wide Web. So he was, you know, he's not an unknown person there. And all through this period, his father was constant, there's this article that you had in your reading suggested, was constantly saying to MIT, hey, you know, you need to, what are you doing this for? What are you doing this for? And, and the point was, maybe they shouldn't, maybe there's no moral obligation for them to um, affirmatively sue the government to stop a prosecution. But just because there's not that moral obligation, it's hard to conclude necessarily there wouldn't be even a lesser moral obligation to make clear the facts right, about MIT's own policy. That's what MIT's report said. Only we understand the policy, and we didn't say anything about it. And you've got to think very practically of the consequences of that. It was two years of prosecution. Aaron had accidentally earned a ton of money with Reddit. All of that money was gone at the point at which he killed himself. So he had imagined the rest of his life was, you know, he lived very frugally set. He was just going to do his activist work. Now that he had this money, it was all gone. Because that's what it costs to defend yourself when you're being sued by the federal government, unless you're a poor person who just decides to accept the um, settlement offer, just sort of in a felony in jail. OK, more. Who else knew something about this? JSTOR has a policy against um, um, has a policy against mass download. So the technical question is, what kind of legal obligation is that? Is it a contract, um, or is it a um, like a property rule? And what the CFAA tries to do is to turn it into something like a property rule, where if you trespass, you turn into um, you turn it into a criminal activity. But the point is. The government was not charging him with unauthorized access to JSTOR. It was unauthorized access to MIT. And that was because JSTOR had said, we don't want to have anything to do with this. So they dropped all the JSTOR stuff. And one of the things his father constantly said to MIT is, if you would just say the same thing, you know, we could settle for something pretty easy and make this thing go away. Um, but MIT wouldn't take the same position, so that's why they continued the prosecution against MIT. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, why would that be justifiable? Why could that be justifiable? I mean, what in the facts that I've showed you here gives you a, you know, if you were a prosecutor, gives you a reason to say, yeah, we need, we need to really try to teach a lesson here. More cases like this from him, and maybe more cases like this from other people he inspires. Right? So he goes to University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, and he talks to a bunch of CS undergraduates. And he tells the CS undergraduates, you guys need to go out there and start downloading stuff and posting it everywhere. The government could legitimately say, look, we need a way to make sure this doesn't happen. This doesn't happen. Our job is to make sure this doesn't happen. Um, and um, we can see that he's been a troublemaker before the PACER database, the copyright database. He seems to like the idea of going and liberating databases. We need to teach him a really important lesson. Um, so, the, so I actually think that from that perspective, the, the motivation of the government was not hard to understand and probably not, um, probably not inappropriate. 
But the, but the part that crosses the line in my head is, well then, what's the way in which you need to teach him this lesson? Do you teach him the lesson by kicking him? <laughs> or do you teach him the lesson the way the government teaches companies the lesson all the time, or people the lesson all the time, where you sit down and you say, okay, we're gonna have a suspended sentence here. Um, you're gonna agree to be called a felon and go to jail for five years if you cross this line again, period, that's it. Um, so that's a practice the government engages in in a lot of different contexts, and one of the questions here was, given you saw the motive was nothing about personal gain, why wouldn't that be the appropriate response here? Except that MIT has taken that political position. Like it wants to, on the one hand, be known as a politically active institution pushing open access. That's what it famously sort of number of uh, events where it's tried to take that position. So it would be completely appropriate, I guess, for a university to say we don't want to be on that fight. But once you've been on that fight, then the question is what do you, what's the appropriate way to carry it through? And that's part of what the MIT community is concerned about because they're like, well, have you lost and this is, the, this is again where your institutional corruption sensors go up, have you lost the sense of your mission? So why would MIT lose the sense of the mission? What would the influence be that would drive them not to be aggressively defending Aaron or aggressively defending open access? Funding, Funding from? Um, from the government. Now I personally don't think this was part of the motive, but many people at MIT think, well, you're you're not willing to stand up to the government because you get about a billion dollars in government money. Um, so you don't want to become an enemy. Yeah. What's the Media Lab's Lab's funded by private companies um, and by private foundations. Um, but private companies are basically members in the Media Lab and they pay a bunch of money to have special access to the genius inventions of the Media Lab. But it's not, they don't have, they're not like government funded in the way that other uh, parts of MIT are government. That's contract. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. He he should be up there too. The problem is there are there are three he's. Aaron fired two lawyers on the way to the final one, um, and. Uh, You know, one of the big problems is his third lawyer was in California, so he had no real sense of what Aaron was going through. So he was very non-communicative with Aaron about what was going on. He was very optimistic indeed the day Aaron died. He just had a hearing where he was convinced the case was gonna disappear, but he didn't communicate that. Um, um, so that's right, that would be another thing to pick up. Okay, more. What, yeah. Well, first, there's no open access policy at Harvard. So the way MIT did react would have been how Harvard would have appropriately reacted in the sense that Harvard would have nothing to say about why what Aaron did was not, um, uh, shouldn't be prosecuted. So I think um, Harvard's political position is different and it would have led to behavior consistent with in fact what MIT did. Um, I'm not sure. I, don't, I actually don't know of similar cases in Harvard's past. There's been a bunch of cases in MIT's past, but I don't know of uh, Harvard's past in this. Um, uh, if you use the Harvard network to do illegal things, I don't encourage people to do that. I would, in fact, encourage you not to. Was there or could there have been some 
Yeah, there's a, it's a great point. There's a, and when you think about what are the influences on the government, there's a lot of pressure on the United States government to be very aggressive in fighting piracy and in defending intellectual property. Um, and so, uh, and so, you know, we have very aggressive U.S. trade representatives who negotiate deals with the Chinese and other countries to force them to protect intellectual property better. Um, but when they're doing that, they're doing that because groups like the Recording Industry Association of America or the MPAA are forcing them to do that because they're trying to protect movies and music. I don't think there has ever been an academic group <laughs> that has said to the government, we want you to protect our intellectual property better so that people can't get access to our writing. Right? So, that, so the point is, there's a strong and understandable motivation by creative industries to protect intellectual property, but it bleeds over when you talk about academic work in a way that's unrelated to the interests of many academics here. The people who are genuinely interested in it are the publications, Reed Elsevier um, is one that you know, runs a business around making access to this material, um, and JSTOR, which is a nonprofit but still is effectively running a business, they have an interest, but it has nothing to do with the underlying interest of the academics. So when Aaron was prosecuted, there were many academics who you know, made this point that this is just a product of a kind of backwards intellectual property regime as applied to knowledge as opposed to um, music or films. It was an example of dumb copyright, not copyright bad. Um, uh, but the government doesn't cut it that, s that subtly. You know, it just thinks violate intellectual property, you've made yourself an enemy of the state. Um, um, and, you know, more serious apparently than Wall Street crimes or things like that. Okay, yeah. So it's a great and hard question. Um, I, but here's the, way, here's the way to think about the answer. I don't think it's fair, or anybody would say it's fair, to say whether you're guilty of a crime or not should turn on the desire to set an example for others. You should be determined guilty or not based on what you did. But then the question is, should the penalty be tuned to deter others, or should it be, attuned, should it be tuned just to the objective of retribution um, um, for the harm that you've done. Um, and there is very strong tradition in uh, American law and in the law around the world to say deterrence is an appropriate um, factor to consider in deciding how long the penalty should be. Uh, now, I think that we apply deterrence in a kind of backwards way in American law. The kind of institutions that could be appropriately deterred are institutions like banks. <laughs> you know, if, if you took out JP Morgan and you punish them severely, like the, you know, the corporate death penalty for what happened in 2008, a whole bunch of other institutions would change their behavior overnight. But when you take you know, somebody who's addicted to cocaine and they've gone out and they've committed a crime because they're feeding their addiction and you give them huge penalty because you're trying to get other addicted people to recognize they shouldn't be doing that, it's pretty unlikely that message is going to be received by the targets because they're not really in the rational mode of thinking. They're in a... So we, but typically what the law does is it's extremely harsh on the individual, typically the individual that's not in a good position to actually do anything about their crime, and not sufficiently harsh, in my view, on entities which would rationally account for the deterrence consequence. Um, uh, so I, I wouldn't say that it's wrong to think about deterrence in all cases, but I think it's really important to figure out what the underlying motive of the activity is. So when, you know, when prosecutors were prosecuting Dr. King and when juries were called upon to prosecute Dr. King, even though they 
could have thought to themselves, I don't believe in what that guy wants. Equality for the races, that's ridiculous. I don't believe that. But I understand that he's doing this for some principled reason. Now, that doesn't mean he shouldn't be cr prosecuted, maybe. That shouldn't be, he doesn't, the crime law doesn't apply to him. But it means we need to think about him differently from how we think about somebody who trespasses for the purpose of stealing the cash register. Um, it's just a different kind of crime. And in this case, I don't think there was enough of that. There certainly wasn't enough of that. There was a kind of you know, very strong attitude that was produced by um, you know, a prosecutor. Who, this is his motive. This is the, you know, he's famous for. Um, a couple of judges who wrote about this particular prosecutor, one who now teaches at Harvard, has just said this is the way that office functions. And another thing about the Boston office, which is significant here, is so the Boston US Attorney's Office has a computer crimes division. You have a bunch of lawyers who focus on computer crimes. They don't have a lot of work. Turns out there's more lawyers than work. So when you have a case like this that comes along, you know, well identified local person engaging in a crime where you can really prove that something has been done. These are the cases you love as a prosecutor because you know you can really sink your teeth in and do something with this. The harder cases, like some Russian hacker who's breaking into Citizens Bank and stealing the visa numbers, that's harder to figure out. So if you're looking for a win rate and lots of great um, ability to demonstrate you're actually doing something effective, targets like Aaron become much more vulnerable. I think it's part of the dynamic of what's going on. Now you want to step back and say, is that bad? Not clear it's bad. Not clear it's great for justice, but it might be good for you know, efficient use of government resources. I don't know. It's not unambiguously bad, but um, it certainly would expose him. OK, why don't we take one or two more right here? Or let's start with one who hasn't been asked yet. Yeah. Um, so at the time, at the time he, he, he uh, at the time he died, um, I didn't know enough about the details of where the prosecution was. After he died, um, I, I shared his, his attorney's view that amazingly the way the case had been prosecuted, he was probably going to win. Now win after spending multiple million dollars defending himself. Um, but he would probably not be convicted. Which is why at the very end when the government said, we'll uh, plea bar, we'll accept a plea. The plea is you admit to this crime, you admit you accept a conviction of a felony, um, and we'll give you a limited time in jail and then a halfway house pretty quickly. Um, he said no, he wasn't gonna accept that. And, and what's interesting, I think the biggest motivation for him is that losing his rights as a citizen, he, just, he said, well, just I'll take the time in jail. I'll take the halfway house time. Just don't call it a felony. I don't want to lose my right to vote. I don't want to lose my right to be a participant in the democracy. He wouldn't have said that. OK, one last question over here. Yeah. Uh, I have enormous respect but I I recognize there are huge losses huge losses and I and I uh, I still wouldn't encourage people to civil disobedience in this space just because the extremism of this war is too great you know, Aaron was going to do an enormous amount of good in the world. This was a side issue. And the idea he gets caught up in this and destroyed by this is just you know, crazy. It's just crazy. Um, so as much as I shared his substantive view, I wish to God, <laughs> I wish to God he had just let it go. Just let it go. OK, I apologize for practicing an institutionally corrupt class with you. Um, 
But Bill refused to teach the class, so here it is. <laughs> Thanks very much.